Right now, there's a generation of kids being raised by grandparents because a parent or a child has been lost to addiction. That simple premise became the inspiration behind the film, What About the Kids? The film depicts the conflict, pain, and burden brought on by this epidemic and provides insight on this battle so many of us are currently fighting every day. My name is Jim Wahlberg, the director of the film, What About the Kids? As an addict in recovery myself, I've made it my mission to help expose the truth of what's really happening to many of our families. The effects of this crisis are found everywhere, in every state, every city, and every neighborhood, maybe even in your own home. The truth is, the most dangerous drugs known to man have gone mainstream, and it's right there in our faces, everywhere we look. And our families are losing. We're losing our sons, we're losing our daughters, our mothers, our fathers. Behind every life lost, there's pain, trauma, and devastation for every one of our loved ones. I want to introduce you to the Feinstein family, a normal middle-class family whose son Dennis is a person in recovery. After the tragic loss of his wife Yolanda, who was also a person who suffered from addiction, it led them into making a decision no family should have to make. You know, while Dennis was still living with us, uh, at that time, we, he was living with us. What can I say? He was here. He was not here, but he was physically here. And we had that discussion, and we came to the conclusion, we have to take the children. He has a very loud personality. <laughs> yes. He truly knew that the stability and well-being of the children would be better served if, in fact, they were here. The Feinsteins have invited us into their home to share their story from the unfortunate losses to the eventual triumphs, the uncomfortable truth of what it is to be one of the true life stories that inspired us to make the film, What About the Kids? Good morning. This is Donovan. He's in the middle of his online instruction with his teacher, Mrs. D. Felice. He's a great teacher. When Dennis was in active addiction, I would, I would be shaking. I would go to sleep at night. I would sing prayers to myself because they soothed me. I knew I was powerless and he didn't care whether he lived. And that was the worst part of it all. He, he really didn't care. He really thought death would be relief. Dennis is one of the lucky ones. With the help of his family, ultimately he was able to survive his addiction. And although he has struggled almost his entire life with it, the worst of it seems to be in the past. I had a chance to talk to Dennis about his history of abuse and trauma and events that led to some of his darkest days. Tell me about Yolanda losing her, her battle with addiction. On April, April 21st, 2013, I was at my mom's house and, uh, um, and I got a call from the hospital that she, she, she wasn't gonna make it. You know, there was just no way her heart would stop. They couldn't get it to start and she was gone. And, um, and, and I was scavenging the house. Like I need something right now. Like I just needed something. And I remember um, <clears throat> my mom had the kids out in the pool and I was sitting there, I'm getting emotional, but I was sitting in my mom's bedroom holding our wedding picture and things weren't great. Like we were literally like probably this close to like divorcing and never talking again, you know, like with restraining orders. And I got that call and, and it was almost like nothing had happened. It was a sound that you don't hear. And I walked in and I looked at him and I, I hugged him. And when she looked at me, she knew. I didn't have to tell her, she knew. And I said, I'm so sorry. And no matter what had happened before, I knew how much Dennis loved Yolanda. In the film, What About the Kids? Our protagonist, Seth, faces his worst fear, losing his wife and the mother of his child. 
Nicole. These tragic events are way too common in today's society, but it's the aftermath of these preventable deaths that may have the most profound effect on these families. Please, please, no, 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 no. Nicole! Nicole, wake up! Nicole, please, 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 wake up, please, wake up! And it was, it was, it was a really rough, it was a really rough time. Um, I think telling Emma had to be one of the hardest things I ever had to do. And so it was a difficult time. We all just sort of sat there crying and Donovan was in, like, he was really confused. He was only three, so he didn't understand what was going on. But it was, it was difficult. The children were uh, immediately uh, brought back to Harvey and I, and at that time, uh, Dennis was still living with us. But when Yolanda passed, he just went south. It, it just really turned south. So the first question was the children. What do we do with the children? It was hard seeing him lay on the couch all day doing absolutely nothing. At that point, he struggled and struggled for about three or four months. But it was actually the time when I did sit down to make the direct amends to him. And he reminded me that August 5th, 2015, I woke up in their front yard. Uh, we had the kids with us. He was wrapped in a blanket. It was pouring rain at our front doorstep. We never let him in. We called a counselor who we know, David, and he came immediately and took him to a treatment center. And it took me about um, 18 months to actually stop and get into recovery, which I tricked myself into. I didn't want to be in it, but I took the suggestions and I got the message. It took Dennis believing that there was a better way, that life would be better for him. It was a day or two later, I was outside and I was smoking a cigarette with my dad and, uh, and he looked at me and he said, now you can live the life that you'd be proud of. So Dennis, tell me about, you know, what it was like growing up. I met your parents, some wonderful people, um, but they did indicate that you had some difficulties early on. They could see sort of a pattern developing. The childhood was wonderful. I mean, I got to do what, you know, what a lot of kids get to do, you know, friends' houses, sleepovers, birthday parties, playing soccer baseball, you know, whatever it was, you know, I, I had a good time, everything was fine. And then there was an incident that came up um, that made my parents a little overprotective, you know, something happened to me. When Dennis was nine, uh, he had uh, a childhood friend and we were family friends. We, we loved this family. It was actually my childhood best friend's uncle after a soccer game, took me back to his house and he molested me. He told me not to talk about it, don't tell anybody brought me home, and I didn't talk about it. I didn't say anything, because I was scared. I didn't know what he would do. I didn't know if I did anything wrong. I was nine years old, and it happened again, and it happened again, and it happened again, until eventually he got caught. I got a call from the uh, detective in, in Margate uh, asking me if I knew this uncle. What this man did to Dennis and to our entire family. I felt he was a monster. Uh, I didn't have any forgiveness in my heart. He had harmed my wonderful son. And, uh, and my parents became overprotective. So there was no more friends' houses and birthday parties and sleepovers. It was, um, you know, stay in the house. At the time, I didn't understand it. You know, I kind of resented it at the time. Um, but in order for me to get out of the house at that point, I either had to sneak out or I had to skip school or I wasn't surrounding myself with the type of people. I, I was the kind of kid that always wanted to be like whoever I was around. I was a chameleon. And, and that's where, you know, a lot of the behavior started stemming from that I know my, uh, my mom was concerned about. She didn't know if I'd make it to 15 and then 25 and then, you know, so on. Because like my behaviors are sneaking out at night and people were stealing cars or breaking into cars. And, and I was just emulating those behaviors with them trying to be like them because I thought that, you know, that was the cool thing to do. And one of them, you know, was carrying a bottle around and I thought that was really cool. 
And I remember, um, you know, I drank for the first time. I absolutely thought it was disgusting. I hated it. I hated the way I felt, but I had to do it again the next day. And these behaviors eventually led to juvenile detention center and then juvenile detention center and then county jail and, you know, all the way up to state prison. And that's almost my childhood in a nutshell. Facing drug addiction in a criminal justice system not designed to help people go through what is truly a healthcare issue sometimes can lead to an endless cycle of incarceration and failed attempts to reach sobriety. Even with good intentions, the system generates more than not halfway results, and halfway there could be the difference between life and death. I hate it there. Halfway to whale. What? You said halfway there, halfway to whale. Uh, I don't know, actually. Um, hmm, I guess halfway to getting better. Then why would you want to leave without getting there first? <laughs> getting where? Better. So at what point did you meet your then girlfriend, future wife? So I had, um, I had met Yolanda uh, after I got out of prison, literally like within a matter of weeks. She was actually dating a friend of mine's brother and, and I actually had went over there to get drugs and he was the one giving them to me and I met her there. Throughout the entire relationship, addiction was the one thing we had in common, you know, because we didn't always get along, but when it came to we had what we needed, we were great. When we didn't, we weren't. They were only interested in themselves and survival at that time. Never liked that situation. It wasn't, it wasn't anything I knew. You know, when she got pregnant with Emma, she stayed clean during her pregnancy. How far along in the relationship did you guys get pregnant? Very early on. In late 2005, when Hurricane Wilma hit, is when we actually got together, because I brought her to stay at my parents' house with me at the time. By June of 2006, so six months later, I was already back in prison and she was pregnant. So it was within six months. It was within so six she months. stayed there with your folks while you were in, in prison? Uh, initially, and then she went back to work while she was pregnant. She was able to get, uh, get her own place. She, she usually never had a problem with that. I, I had a problem with that. You know, she had no problem paying bills and living on her own, and I had a big issue with it. I, I, it's not that I had an issue with it. I didn't know how to do it. I never lived on my own without my mother's help. Emma was born while I was there. Um, and when I got out, I picked up right back where I left off. She didn't want to, you know, at the time. And then, uh, and eventually she saw me doing it, she did it, and before I knew it, we were both back off to the races. Um, and I guess we're trying to help people understand that part of it because, you know, people think, well, you're, you're married, you got this little baby, and like, why aren't you doing this? Or why aren't you doing that? Or why don't you just stop, right? Um, and I don't know, can you, can you help us sort of understand how bad things were getting and and you guys are trying to hold this, this little family together as well. Yeah, so it was always, and, and you said it perfectly, I, you know, I lost the power of choice and, and I don't realize it in the moment. And I felt like, of course, Emma was the most important thing in the world, right? Unless I had what I needed to feel okay, like I was no good for her. And I would convince myself that I needed to get that in order to be a good father. Because like, I can't even sit here and watch the show with her because all I'm doing is thinking about is getting that next one and I'm staring at the phone and I can't go to your school functions and I can't walk it unless I have it. The one thing that people see as the thing tearing an addict apart, the addict actually sees it as it's the one thing holding them together, mm -hmm. right? And I don't think people, I think that's sort of the best possible explanation it is. to give somebody because you can't, uh, they just don't get it. They say, well, if this thing is hurting you, why don't you just stop, right? But if you turn the tables, it's, no, no, you don't understand. I'm much worse without this, right? I'm, I'm completely useless without this. And I think that's, uh, that's the, the one thing that I, like, normal people don't seem to grasp fully. So like I needed it to go to work. I needed it to stay at work. I needed it um, you know, to clean the house. I needed it to do laundry. I needed it to go to family functions. I needed it to go to school functions. I needed it to have a conversation just to have a normal conversation with someone, just to look somebody in the eye, like that's what made me feel normal. Life's a lot easier without it. And I didn't know that obviously in active addiction and you couldn't have convinced me of it, 
you know, in active addiction. Emma's born. Now you're living together. You guys are living together. At what point did you get married? Uh, we got married. It was very, it was September 5th in 2007. It was like a spur of the moment, man, like an impulsive, you know. That's she, the year Emma was born? Emma was born in 2006. 2006, so she, Emma was almost one or one-ish. Yeah. And then you got married. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Emma, it was September 5th of 2007. And it was just like a spur of the moment. Let's just, you know, run to JCPenney's and buy a white shirt for the pictures. I'll charge a engagement ring on, on my mother, or well, my JCPenney's card that my mother's gonna pay the bill on, you know? And, um, and we just kind of like ran with it. But as sick as we both were, I believe we did love each other, you know? And that's what we wanted to do at the time. Her poor stepdaughter, we used to have her watching over Emma while we would sleep all day. Um, and, and it just became a complete disaster to the point that we couldn't even get that house clean. We just literally had to move. I wasn't entirely sure what was going on most of the time. Like a lot of the time, like they would just fight and then they'd be like, you know what? Emma, which one of us is your favorite and the other one's going? And then my mom would end up kicking my dad out of the house and then calling him later asking why he wasn't there. Their mental stability wasn't the best. You know, and then the same thing happened with the next house. It was a lot better than the old house because there weren't rats everywhere and the walls weren't shaking because there were rats everywhere. And, and that's when things got really bad. You know, she became unfaithful, warning me the whole time that she was gonna do that if this, did, if this continued. I loved her, I didn't want her to do that, but she wasn't the most important thing in my life, you know? And, um, and I wasn't the most important thing in her life. You know, we both had that as a common denominator. And so she started stepping out and then we started fighting and then I started spending nights out of the house, um, but usually at my parents' house if they would let me because um, it had gotten to that point where they didn't necessarily feel comfortable with me there. So you guys are struggling with the relationship. You're obviously full-blown addiction, mm -hmm. both of you, right? Both struggling, living in less than desirable accommodations, right. put it the nice way, right? Yeah, oh yeah. And, um, and so you're raising two girls mm -hmm. in this, right? Your daughter and your stepdaughter, mm -hmm. right? And then pregnant again pregnant again. She was somehow able to stop using for the nine months. I didn't. I, while she was pregnant with Donovan, I think I overdosed once. Um, they weren't sure what exactly happened to me. Um, and I always had the excuse because I, I would take something that would cause a seizure if you didn't take it. And, I, and whenever I would take too much of something else, I'd, I'd have the excuse, oh, I just had a seizure. That's why I look like this. So that's why I feel like this. You know, I know my mom remembers a bunch of incidents I don't remember, but I was, I continued to use throughout Donovan's pregnancy. She, you know, she didn't. And I had her convinced that there were certain narcotics that I needed. Like, it wasn't that I want to just get high. Like, I need these to, like, function. Like, she would find it no matter where it was. And while I was in the hospital, like, she found it all, you know? And, um, and then she, I guess she brought it to work with her. Um, and, she didn't tell me that she started using again until, um, you know, after she gave birth to Donovan. When he was about a month or two old, she called me and she's like, I have to be honest with you. Like, I've, the stuff that I found in the house, like, was sitting at work and, like, I've been using it every day at work. And, and I had been using every day, too, without her knowing about it. And before you know it, we were using again. And it you brought know? you back together, mm -hmm. right? This, this, you, you got seats next to each other on the Titanic. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I realized at this point there was nothing I could do. It was all up to him. You could help all you want. It's going to be rejected. This is scary, because you just never know. He used to have a motto, I'm here for a good time, not for a long time. And that is a, that is telling. Did it ever occur to you, one time while you were praying for me, that just maybe I could have used that time? Did you ever think that just maybe I needed my mom to talk to. I mean, you knew I couldn't talk to dad. There were so many times, mom, so many times when I was so lost and I needed someone to go to. You gave all your time to God. 
And you gave none of yours. I almost died or I almost ended up with a life sentence in prison probably 10 times each. Uh, and I, I teetered on the brink. You know, that's where I like to live at, like on the edge. You know, and it didn't feel good unless I was like on that edge. And it, there wasn't fear involved. It was, and I didn't want to die. I just wanted to feel what it felt like so close to it. Because like, I just didn't like, I always thought that if I didn't like how I felt, I had to take something to change it. I always thought that. And uh, I'm an addict, so the first time I didn't like how I felt, I had to take something to change it and probably took entirely too much. And then I had to take something to change that. And before I knew it, 15 years of my life went by just trying to stay feeling different, you know, not trying to go through the feelings. I never knew that feelings passed. That was something new for me. And I remember August 5th, 2015, homeless, going over to my parents' house, and I would knock on the door only when I knew my dad was not there because he would definitely not let me in the house. The point was to go in there and find something to go sell so I could get high or whatever it was. And I remember going in the house. Donovan didn't turn his head away from the TV. He didn't really care that I was there at all. Emma, she loved me, but she knew how I was. And she ran into her room and hit her piggy bank because it was me in the house. Was that I may not be able to get to it, get some money and get out before she noticed. Because she'd always notice. And she'd be able to tell you exactly to the penny how much I took. like. Just my luck, I had a math genius as a daughter as I'm trying to take out of the piggy bank. And, and, and that's just how, the, that's how it was, man. Talk to me about your relationship with, with your parents, right? Individually, right? So your relationship with your mom now. To quote my cousin, or maybe it was my uncle, like I hit the mother lottery. You know, I really did. And there's just no other way to say it. She's just the most genuine soul um, pure hearted person who somehow lives by the 12 steps and has never worked them. I don't know how it happened. I could tell her about everything bad and she'll find something positive to come out of it. She's just an amazing person. I mean, she gets so excited and overwhelmed when they talk about you, in particular in the work that you do. Talk about that a little bit. Talk about what you do for work, having a passion, something that makes you jump out of the bed in the morning to be of service to others and what that means to you. Okay. I work in addiction recovery treatment now. You know, my dad, he used to always say all the time, if you love what you do, you never have to go to work again. And like, I feel like I never have to work. I was the worst of the worst. And like, if it could work for me and turn my life, I mean, you want to talk about a rags to riches story. You know, I'm homeless living on the streets with nowhere to go. And now, I. Uh, I had car trouble four weeks ago and was able to go to the car dealership and get a new one. Like, that's insane to me. You know, I used to have to bum money to go buy a single cigarette if, if the store would sell it. And I go to work to help people, you know? So I would probably do what I do for free and have to find another way to pay bills. But, um, but I absolutely love it, you know? I absolutely love it. It's a lifestyle for me. And now he's bringing peace and life to many people. I, I like to say he saves lives every day. I am beyond proud. If there was a better word for proud, I would use it. God has been very good to me. The gifts that I have been given, all I was promised was freedom from active addiction. That's it. Everything else has been an absolute blessing in my life. And I feel like Everything that I just discussed and everything that ever happened to me and everything that I ever went through, put myself through, God put me through, whatever the case, was all to lead me up to the actual moment where I am right now in the situation to help the people that I'm helping today. Dennis's story, unfortunately, is not unique in today's America. Today in America, many are going through the very same circumstance and it takes patience, empathy, and a true understanding to not only recover but to hopefully thrive. Every day it weighs heavy on my soul to see so many in society just ignore these issues until they land on their very own doorstep. So many of us think this will never happen to me until it does. My hope is hearing Dennis's story helps people understand this crisis and to see that it is possible to beat the odds and not just become another statistic to make us a wiser and more compassionate world I believe God can save us all. 
but it takes all of us on the ground to carry out God's work. I'm Jim Wahlberg, addict, activist, and filmmaker, sending gratitude for lending us your attention in the hopes that the stories we share will make a difference in this battle, a difference that will save lives. So that you know too